Psalms chapter 119, Psalms chapter 119 verse 18. Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for this blessed evening time. Thank you for Pastor Peter. Thank you for uh, Sister Lynn. Thank you for this little gathering. Lord, uh, thank you for your strength upon your servant, Lord. Talk to us, teach us, guide us, lead us. Your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay, it's lovely to see you all again. Uh, so sorry about last week uh, when I uh, had to finish a bit earlier. But uh, to make up for it, uh, we'll carry on till about half past ten tonight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> no, will we finish? Will we finish well before nine o'clock? Don't don't worry uh, about that. All right. Um, during the, the last couple of weeks, um, in in the first week, I was looking at the life of Caleb because it's sort of covered from before they, they entered the land till they went into the land till they conquered the land, and it actually sort of carries on into Judges and sort of looking at some of the things that were um, happening there. Then I gave a brief overview about what happens in the book of Joshua. And then last week, I just looked at a few verses and certain lessons that we could learn. But tonight, I want to look at one of the most difficult issues in the Bible. And this is something that uh, if ever you're witnessing and people know a bit about the Bible or they're looking for arguments against becoming a Christian, one of the things that they may say is this, how could a God of love command the destruction of whole communities of Canaanites, including women and children, all right? And I think that's a difficult thing. Um, and so what I want to do is look at it tonight, and I want the, you to share some of your ideas. So let me just uh, fill in a little bit of the background uh, that I covered in the first week about how they conquered Canaan. Um, and what you find is that the book of Joshua, there's two it's split into two, really, okay? The first half is to do with the conquest. And uh, in that first half, what you've got, you've got Joshua is going around the land with all Israel, right? The whole nation, the whole army is going. And they are attacking certain cities, and they're defeating these cities. And I often use that phrase, they're breaking the back of the Canaanite um, opposition, now, they weren't leaving people behind, though, so they had to go right the way throughout the land. They needed everyone with them, first of all. And it was only when that first stage was over that the, the individual tribes were given their allocation of land. All right? So Joshua and all Israel, in the first half, they're going around together. In the second half, it's up to the individual tribes. So what happened is that Joshua uh, drew lots. Okay, thanks. To Joshua drew lots so that um, people realized that it wasn't Joshua's idea, it was God's allocation. And the individual tribes, then were, they were told, right, well, you go and take possession of that bit of land that God is given to you. Now, I've mentioned that in the first part, there are these three military campaigns. And they start off, they come in from that side of the land there. They come up the other side of the River Jordan. And uh, the first thing they do is they go through the center of the land. They cross the river at a place called Gilgal. Remember, I mentioned last week about crossing the river. Again, that's a reminder of what happened with Moses when he went through the Red Sea. Um, I was talking as well about being one of those priests who was uh, carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and uh, they could see the river, and it says it was flooded at that time. And it wasn't until their toes touched the river that it, it, remember, it parted. And I said, sometimes, you know, God leaves things till the last minute. It, it was nice for us to see the answer um, before we get there. But uh, they went over. They stopped at a place called Gilgal. The men were circumcised there because they hadn't been circumcised while they were down in Egypt or um, uh, during the wilderness uh, years. Then they tasted the grain of the land, which was much better than the manna. Uh, and God's got better things for us. But actually, these were things that they had to fight for. They go up against mighty Jericho. They're obedient to God. Even these strange commands about walking around in silence and then all shouting on the, uh, on the seventh day. And God gave them a great victory against mighty Jericho. 
and they put all the people to death. And God had said, not just put the people to death, don't touch any of the gold, silver clothes. But someone had sinned, Achan. He had taken some of the garments and silver and gold. And because of that, when they went up against a much smaller opposition called Ai, they got defeated. And uh, that sin needed to be dealt with. After that, you may remember that uh, there were some Gibeonites. They'd uh, dressed up in old clothes and had moldy bread and pretended they'd come from a long way away. And uh, Joshua, without consulting God, just made a promise that he wouldn't attack them. Uh, and later on, he found out he'd been tricked, but he still kept his word. And uh, when they were attacked by five Amorite kings, he helped defend these Gibeonites. And by that time, the land is effectively cut in two. They've, they've come through there. Then they sweep south, all right? And I'm going to look at that in a minute because it's mainly in this southern campaign that you've got a lot of lightning quick attacks, uh, but you've also got the total annihilation of the population of the villages in the south. And then later on, they go to the north. Um, one of the kings in a place called Hatzor gets a lot of the Canaanites behind, gets all their chariots, but... Uh, Joshua and all Israel managed to ambush them in a forest area, and uh, they, they win the north. And by that time, we're roughly halfway through the book, and it's after that that they begin sharing out the land. But as I said, it's really this southern campaign. And uh, I'm going to read the verses. I've got the, the verses, and I've highlighted some of them because it raises this issue of their destruction. So uh, it says, then... I'm just going to get up and get a little bit nearer to that. And hopefully I'll get a new pair of glasses by the time I'm with you next. <laughs> then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Makedar to Libna and attacked it. There's a lot of city names here, and I know some of them will be unfamiliar. The Lord also gave that city and its king into Israel's hand. The city and everyone in it Joshua put to the sword he left no survivors there and he did to its king as he had done to the king of Jericho because he'd slaughtered the king of Jericho as well then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Libna to Lachish he took up positions against it and attacked it the Lord handed Lachish over to Israel and Joshua took it on the second day one of the things that I mentioned, I think it probably in week one, is these are lightning quick attacks. For those who are old enough to know stuff about the Second World War, um, they often talked about Hitler and the Blitzkrieg, the lightning war, because with his tanks, his panzer tanks, and uh, he was able to occupy large areas very, very quickly. So they, they go on, and this city lasts two days. The city and everyone in it, he put to the sword, just as he had done to Libna. Meanwhile, Horam, king of Giza, had come up to help Lachish, but Joshua defeated him and his army until no survivors were left. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Lachish to Eglon. They took up positions against it and attacked it. They captured it that same day and put to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it, just as they had done to Lachish. Then Joshua and all of Israel with him went up from Eglon to Hebron and attacked it. They took the city and put it to the sword, together with its king, its villages, and everyone in it. They left no survivors. Just as at Eglon, they totally destroyed it and everyone in it. Then Joshua and all Israel with him turned around and attacked Debir. They took the city. And its villages. Can I just say, with the villages, lots of people lived outside the, the city. The cities were not that huge. There wasn't enough room for everyone to live inside. And so some people would live outside and they'd be doing farming and stuff outside. But they were the most vulnerable uh, people there. They took the city and its villages and put them to the sword. Everyone in it, they totally destroyed. They left no survivors. They did to Debir and its king as they had done to Libna and its king, and to Hebron. So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills, and the mountain slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, just as Yahweh, 
the God of Israel had commanded. Joshua subdued them from Kedesh Barnea to Gaza and from the whole region of Goshen to Gibeon. All these kings and their lands Joshua conquered in one campaign, this southern campaign, because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. So, you know, that's just going through that passage. And it gives you a clear indication of what is happening. These lightning quick raids, total destruction of all the enemy. Now, uh, in Hebrew, this uh, is called, this total destruction, the word is harem. Can I just say, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to have the tea and coffee early uh, in a minute. And then when we come back, what I would like you to do is you to discuss amongst yourselves, what would you say to someone who says, how can you believe in a God who's supposed to be a God of love and yet commands these things? So maybe just in your tables, just to have a talk and think about how you might reply. And I'd like to hear your ideas, and then I'll look at uh, some of the things, that, some of the um, possible ways we can talk about this. So what, what happens is, if you read the NIV, it says in Joshua uh, chapter 10, Now Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it. And that's the way they um, translated it. Doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king. And in the NIV footnote, it says the Hebrew term, and uh, oh, it hasn't come out properly there, but it, it, it's pronounced kerem, refers to the irrevocable, that means the permanent, the, um, I've written down there, irreversible, giving over of things or person to the Lord, often by totally destroying them. All right, so, you know, that person's future, that's all in the hands of God now, uh, and because of, I, I've killed him. So this crops up, and you can see uh, on there, in all these verses, lots of which I have, uh, I have read the harem. So what we'll do is we'll have a cup of coffee or tea now and cake or, and biscuits and stuff like that. But I'd like you to discuss this question. How could a God of love command the destruction of whole communities of Canaanites, including women and children? Um, I've used that phrase. It's a, it's a horrible phrase. Ethnic cleansing. Uh, some of you might remember that, particularly from former Yugoslavia, where the Serbians and the Croats and the Muslims, they were just killing people, mainly on racial grounds, also on religious grounds um, as well. And that's what some people will say, you've got a God who believes in ethnic cleansing. So have a nice cup of tea, have a nice discussion, and tell me the answer. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. I'll just break now. So I'll just leave it open. Does anyone make any suggestions before? A number of people are, are, are shaking their heads. Shane. Yep. Okay. Right. Okay. So um, I'm just wondering where I can put here. Um, you, you need a radical answer to a serious problem. And what what verse were you? Yep.
Right. Oh, so, sorry, I'm not writing terribly clearly there. Okay, I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to that. Well done for finding that verse. It's a good verse and it's quite an important verse uh, as well. Anyone got anything else there? Faith. Now it's the repercussions are coming onto the children. Yeah, that's that's in Jeremiah. It, 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 it's, so in it's, yeah, although Jeremiah is saying things will not be like that in the future, so he's saying that there there will be a change. So yeah, yeah, that's that's good. Uh, David, the first argument yeah. about you kill the children so that you don't carry on yeah. the the sin ignores the fact that you then create children of other races that grow up but then hate the Israelites because of what they've done and this all this thing that's on now we see every night on the television that the right I'm not going to say the Jews the right wing Israeli government which is kept in power by fanatics uses this to, to justify killing the Palestinians <laughs> because they say from the Jordan to the sea that's what the promise them. They use this to justify 40,000 civilians killed for 1,500 Jews. Okay, I will, I will touch. I want to make sure we focus just on the biblical stuff, but I think that's a very valid thing uh, to say. Right, let, let me get going with a few pointers. Now, can I just say, I, ultimately, I don't think there is a cast iron answer to this, right? Because otherwise people would have discovered it by now. I think all we can do is give pointers uh, and uh, trust as well to the grace of God Let's not forget, we don't argue anyone into the kingdom of God. It's the work of God's Holy Spirit. But at the same time, the Bible encourages us to always be ready to give an answer to people of the hope that we've got. Uh, so there's a bit of a responsibility on us to find out about these things and to think, okay, are there things that I can see? Interesting that you found um, uh, one of the key verses, I think, is Deuteronomy 9, verse 4, which helps us with our understanding. I'll come back to that. But actually, there's another key verse that crops up much, much earlier. And this is back during the time of Abraham, all right? Um, and Abraham is, God speaks to him about what's going to happen to his descendants in the future. So it says, as the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. The Lord said to him, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. And they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. Now that's talking about uh, being down in Egypt and in slavery there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves and afterwards they will come with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Now, the Amorites is just another word for Canaanites, all right? You don't need to worry too much about that. But God is saying there is a time coming when the people's sin will reach a level where I will intervene. And I think that's an important verse I've got this sort of graph here, if you like, and uh, it seems to me that God is saying, when sin hits a certain level, 
I will intervene. All right? I'm aware that people are sinful, but you know, there are times when I will step in in judgment. And I think there's other things as well, you see, in the life of uh, Abraham that help us understand this sort of thing. There's an incident in Genesis 18 where Abraham meets these three men and they say Sodom is going to be destroyed. All right? And of course, Lot, his nephew, and Lot's wife and his two daughters, they are down there in Sodom. And you can read this story for yourself. But Abraham, after he hears this, he says to God, he said, God, if there's 50 righteous people in Sodom, will you spare it? And God says, yes. And he comes back and says, God, for the sake of five, what if there's only 45 righteous people? Would you spare it? God says, yes. 30 people, God. 20 people, God. 10 people, God. And Abraham finishes there. And God says, for the sake of 10, I won't destroy it. Sadly, there weren't 10. There weren't even five. There were four. And one of those was Lot. Then there was Lot's wife who looked back. Then there were Lot's daughters who later on got their father drunk and committed incest with him. So probably there was only really one righteous person there. And God said, no, I am going to intervene. Now, can I just say, it's interesting looking at that passage because I think that gives us an insight into what prayer is about. It's not that Abraham is knocking God down, you know, challenging God and God is changing his mind. I think that Abraham is discovering the grace of God. Because all of a sudden he discovers that this God who said, look, Sodom deserves to be destroyed. God says, but if there's 50 people there, I won't. If, and, and God had always decided that. If God had found 10 people there, he wouldn't have destroyed them. But Abraham actually discovers that through prayer. So it's not really bargaining with God. It's more discovering the heart of what, God, uh, 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 what, uh, what God's heart is like. Just to say, I, I can't find... Uh, actual evidence of this but I have heard that um, Billy Graham in the past once said words to this effect when you look at the sin of Britain and America now if God doesn't act soon he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah and words like that now I don't know whether that's true but it does present a challenge doesn't it especially when we begin to look and see what is going on there. Now, can I just say as well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for three generations, they had witnessed to the true God there. They'd also set up numerous altars there. I won't go through all these words, but there's one set up at Shechem. There's one set up at Mount Mor Moriah. And there's one set up at Beersheba. Uh, then they rebuild the one at Shechem. Uh, there's another one at Bethel. And uh, so over the centuries, the, the, the um, truth of Yahweh, the, tr the true God, had been shared. And there was evidence of that, but the people had rejected that. And instead, they had started worshipping Baal. And this is the next thing to talk about, because obviously one of the big issues is the people's sin. And... Uh, I've summed this up in these two words, idolatry and immorality. Uh, interestingly, when Len was talking, he was saying about the people would, con would have contaminated the Israelites if they had come into that sort of uh, area. And so what we've got is we've got spiritual idolatry. We've also got physical immorality. And these both threaten to contaminate Israel. If you remember, I, I've shown this numerous times. When we were doing the book of Judges, I mentioned this as well. When people do not have a revelation of who the true God is, very often they try to explain things away in terms of their own gods. And <laughs> amazingly, the weather has a lot to do with this. Now, that, that might sound strange, but uh, you've, some of you will have heard me mention before. If you live down in Egypt, what's the weather like? <laughs> yeah, gorgeous. It's sunny. Yeah, but, and, and I sometimes joke about being an Egyptian weather forecaster. Today is going to be sunny. Tomorrow is sunny. The long-term forecast is sunny. It's going to be warm, right? So the sun dominates your life. 
So who do you worship if you don't know the true God? You worship the sun. Ra, lots of you will have heard of that. Amon, Aton, these are all sun gods. And people begin to interpret things in terms of what happens there. Over in, these are the key areas in the Old Testament. This is what's called Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia means between the rivers, the river Tigris and the Euphrates. And uh, this is, uh, um, oh, sorry, I was going to point there. Ur is down there. This is what, where Abraham uh, came from. But these rivers would shift their course. They would flood. Um, it, life was very unpredictable there. So they tended not to have one or two key gods, but a whole group of gods who were always fighting another. What happens when you come to um, Israel? Israel is there. Now, I'm talking about water here because water is essential to life. You know, I mean, now we're used to having it all on the grid. We just turn on a tap. We don't think about it. But in those days, you had to live near the rivers. There's the River Nile, big and powerful. Tigris and Euphrates, big and powerful. Canaan doesn't have anything on that measure. Yes, it has got the River Jordan going down the middle, but that's not in the same league as these others. Without water, your crops don't grow, right? Uh, and so they depend on the seasonal rains. So you know in the Bible, you might have heard um, the, the, the old versions you're talking about, the early and the latter rain, the spring and the autumn rain. If the rain comes, that's great. The crops grow. You have food. You live. If the rain doesn't come, you die. And again, you know, I, I, I've said this before, we see famines in other countries and thankfully there is some aid that goes to them. But in those days, there was nothing like that. And so if you, the crops didn't grow, you were likely to die. And so who becomes the most important God in the land of Canaan? It is, he's called Baal. Baal just means Lord. All right. His name was Hadad. He was the god of the rain, the god of the storm. And uh, if you look at that uh, picture there, it's cut out of, out, out of stone uh, there. See, it looks, it's, it's not terribly clear. He, ho he holds arrows of lightning, all right, because he's the, the rain god, he's the storm god. He's the god who sends the lightning, he's the god who sends down fire from heaven. Baal, fire from heaven, does that ring any bells of any other stories? Remember the story of Elijah, all right? So when Elijah says, let's see which God can bring down fire from heaven, it's not just an arbitrary thing. He's saying, look, this is what Baal should be good at. Right, well, let's actually see. And of course, it's not Baal who brings down fire from heaven, but it's Yahweh who brings down fire from heaven. So again, knowing a little bit about that, it, Gives you extra insight into some of the stories in the Bible. But he is, oh, sorry, going back to that. He is this God to do with the rain, with the uh, uh, water that comes and feeds the crops, that feeds the animals, that to feed the people, all right? It's all to do with fertility. And uh, at those times, let me just go back, loads and loads of religions were what they called fertility religions. They would have gods and goddesses, and very often the goddesses are, 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 are naked and stuff like that. And their idea of worship was not praise and singing and shouting. It was to engage in acts of fertility, all right? And that is a polite way of a euphemism for saying indulging in sex. They were orgies. So when God says to them, you will not worship me the way they worship their gods, that is what he's talking about. And that's why in books like Leviticus and Deuteronomy, they talk out not just about ordinary heterosexual relationships, but part of this, it was all sorts of sex, sex with animals, homosexual relations. And that's why in the Bible, you've got these strong prohibitions. And so they are coming into this situation, and that is the way in which they worship their gods, all right? So straight away, you have got this difficulty that is going to contaminate them. I've said before in different contexts, sex is big business, pornography is big business, you know, all of that sort of stuff. 
and people are very, very susceptible to that. There are also the health risks. We're all aware of sexually transmitted diseases. I'm, I don't know if that's the common term uh, nowadays, but it's possible that the people were uh, riddled with those sort of diseases. And so God says, no, you know, don't, don't have anything to do with this. And I've written here, drastic situations require drastic measures. Um, sorry to use this illustration, but, you know, sometimes ladies might find a lump in their breast. If they find it early, hopefully there's, it can be dealt with with surgery. Sometimes they have to have the breast removed. It's drastic because it's a drastic situation. And sometimes those are the measures that need to be taken. Uh, and so let me just read from Deuteronomy 20, verses 16 to 18. Uh, let me, um, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. Do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them. The Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshipping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. So... It really was a drastic situation, very, very different to the morality, to the ethos that they had experienced in the wilderness. Then you've got this business about annihilating the Canaanites, all right? I did mention last week or in week uh, one about Rahab. Rahab gets saved. You know, it is not an, uh, a, a racial thing. It is not an eth ethnic thing. Rahab is saved because she says, I've heard about your God. Will your God save me? I'll trust you. And uh, she ends up getting saved. The Gibeonites also get uh, saved as well. And I want to come back to this verse that Shane mentioned uh, in Deuteronomy 9 verse 4. It says, do not say to yourself, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No, no. It is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. All right? You see, sometimes when we read this story, it's the goodies against the baddies. And the Israelites are the goodies, and the Canaanites are the baddies. Um, interesting, I, I remember the Desert Storm Wars, and uh, you know, there's America and Britain, and they're fighting against the Iraqis or the Babylonians because that's who the Iraqis were, the Babylonians back in the Old Testament. So it's obvious whose side God's on, isn't it? Britain and America. Except that in the Old Testament, the Iraqis, the Babylonians, came to attack the Jews. And Jeremiah said, don't fight against them. God's on their side. Hey, what? Well, surely not. And it was very interesting during the Desert Storm War, lots of people quoted verses from the Bible where Babylon was getting destroyed. No one mentioned the fact that Babylon had been used by God, uh, much to the shock of some of the prophets. You know, Habakkuk had said to God, God, look at Judah. It's in a right mess. When are you going to do something about this? And God says, I'm going to do something. It's going to shock you. So I'm going to use the Babylonians. And uh, Habakkuk basically says, but God, you're too pure to look on evil. How can you use the Babylonians? But God is God, and God can use what he wants. And so God can use anyone or anything as his agent of judgment. He can send down fire from heaven. That's what he did against Sodom and Gomorrah, you remember. He could send an angel. There was a time when God judged the Assyrians, there were 186 Assyrians, and God sent along one angel of the Lord. There was a battle, final score, angel of the Lord, 186,000, Assyrians nil. All right? <laughs> this one angel wiped out 186,000 Assyrians. He could send a flood, as he did in the days of Noah, storms, locusts. You know, we go, God does that. Or, as I've said, he can even use the evil Assyrians and Babylonians for his plans and for his purposes to chastise his people. So please don't just think this is the goodies against the baddies. God is saying, I'm wiping out that sin. Um, so just be careful though, because I said that not all the um, Canaanites 
end up getting killed. Some of them get uh, saved. And, and remember, Rahab was one of the ancestors of Jesus as well, which is absolutely brilliant. But you've also got God's consistency in judgment. Because I was mentioning earlier about Ai and Achan. And Achan had disobeyed God and taken the gold, silver, the clothes and stuff like that. What happens to Achan? And not just Achan. It seems incredibly stern. Incredibly. His whole family are wiped out. But he's an Israelite. But the point is that he's sinning. And so it is not on racial grounds, as I said, but it's to do with people's attitude to God and what God has uh, revealed. Also, um, in 2 Kings 21, this is much, much later, God says that there was a, a king called Manasseh, incredibly evil king called Manasseh. And uh, God says, Manasseh has been worse than the Canaanites. One of the kings, one of the, the kings down in Jerusalem, uh, I think I've actually got part of this, but, or I haven't got all of it, but um, in 2 Kings 23, you can read about it. I, I have spoken about this. I did some stuff on Deuteronomy. Um, I think actually it was on, it was on a Sunday. Um, maybe I did, did it midweek as well. But I was talking about the situation that Israel got in later. And I was talking about you could go into the temple and you'd go in the temple and there was a room for worshipping Baal. There was a room for worshipping Ashtoreth, one of the um, Canaanite goddesses. There was a room for worshipping the starry hosts, you know, the sun, moon and stars. All of this is in the temple, the temple of Yahweh down in Jerusalem. You can read it in 2 Kings 23. In the temple... There were the quarters of the male shrine prostitutes. So people would go in and commit homosexual acts in the temple, and the male shrine prostitutes were there in the temple. Um, child sacrifice was happening again. And God said, I've had enough. This is worse than the Canaanites before. So what is God going to do? God is going to be consistent. The Lord said through his servants, the prophets, Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these detestable sins. He's done more evil than the Amorites who preceded him and has led Judah into sin with its idols. Therefore, this is what the God of Israel says. And he says, I'm going to wipe Jerusalem like wiping the, a bowl. You know, you're going, to be, you're going to lose your land, all right? Because God is consistent. So the issue is people's sin, not race again. God is proportionate. Can I just say, the killing was not indiscriminate. The bits I read to you were talking about what happened in uh, that southern campaign. But uh, let me just find uh, this passage. In Deuteronomy 20, uh, let me read out some of the verses in Deuteronomy 20. Uh, not every city was treated like that. Because God said, uh, in Deuteronomy, you can, you've got that. And don't forget, you'll get the, all the notes. Uh, you know, please just uh, get in touch with Jim. Uh, he'll be able to send you the notes. It says, when you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. If they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and work for you. All right? So they can surrender. They'll be slaves, but there is that possibility. If they refuse to make peace and engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, put to the sword all the men in it. As for the women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourself, and you may use the plunder the Lord your God gives you from the enemies. This is how you are to treat all the cities that are at a distance from you and do not belong to the nations nearby. So they've clearly got a rules for conduct in warfare but these ones right in the heart of Canaan it says however the cities of the nations the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance do not leave anything alive that breathes completely destroy them so I just want to say that you know it's not every single city but God had said these cities you know and it's because of their sin because of what's going on there they need to be totally uh, destroyed I do want to say a little bit about the cultural context as well. Um, although these things seem really awful to us, I want to suggest that uh, in those days they were probably not considered so awful. They were considered 
normal. And sadly, David raised this issue about what's going on in Gaza. Whether we like it or not, the IDF have been accused of genocide. There's some horrendous, there must be some horrendous things that are going on even today. Um, in all, all, all sorts of wars, you know, I was talking earlier about the Yugoslavian uh, thing and the evidence that they found against people where they just slaughtered and they butchered people. And these things sadly do happen in uh, times of war. And uh, just to, you know, give some examples. Uh, uh, yeah, there's no youngsters here. Yeah, that's okay. Um, here's an article that was written just a, a few, less than 10 years ago, and it's talking about the sort of things that Egypt was doing at the same time, all right? So one of their um, pharaohs, Amin Hoptep, presided over a mass holocaust of prisoners of both sexes and all ages. Um, so they, they were set on fire, um, those there. Uh, another pharaoh called Menepta, um, it says, Libyan captives were impaled, destroyed, carried off to Egypt. Fire was hurled against their multitude in the presence of what we probably think is their relatives. So they find it hard to, to, um, to interpret that word. But it looks as though they were deliberately destroyed in front of their relatives. And then their relatives, their hands were cut off because of their crimes. Others had eyes and ears removed. Um, but the way you find the same thing happens to one of the last kings of Israel. He sees his sons put to death, and that's the last thing he sees, and then his, uh, the Assyrians take, put his eyes out. I, I, I found a uh, picture, a uh, sort of relief again, that had been carved uh, out, out of stone, and I, f I forgot to bookmark it, and I can't find it again. And there's a picture of this king who has just won the battle, and he's portrayed very big, all right? And then there are all these bodies lying down, and they've all been beheaded, and the heads are placed between the legs of the soldiers, all right? Um, and and I, can I just say, while we find this shocking, can I just say, if you read stories of what happened during the French Revolution, and maybe we've seen films on the TV, all these hundreds and thousands of people turn up to watch people be beheaded with the guillotine. In Britain, in the 19th and early 20th century, public hangings would rarely have less than 5,000 people. And if it was someone notorious, they reckon the crowds of up to 100,000 people would turn up. I just find that just astonishing. So these sort of things carry on. And there's other things that uh, it talks there about bringing people back, torturing them in front of crowds. Uh, that was the context in which people lived. So the culture, I, I'd like to say, has totally changed, but it, it it's quite clearly hasn't changed. And uh, Stalin, Chairman Mao, they killed millions, millions and millions of people. Um, I do want to say as well, not just to do with culture, but with changing times, there's a phrase that sometimes we use about progressive revelation, that God gradually reveals more and more of his plan. He doesn't do it all at once, but meets people in the situations, in the society in which they live, and gradually expands. So there are certain Old Testaments that do not apply today. The Old Testament says, you shall not commit adultery. What happened in the Old Testament if you did? If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. What happens when we come to the New Testament? And we come to Jesus, who is confronted by a woman who has been, uh, who has been committing adultery. I've got the whole passage there. I won't go through it all. I think that you will know it. Jesus said, let him without sin cast the first stone. And they all walked away. And Jesus had an opportunity to. And Jesus could have. He was without sin. But he says, neither do I condemn thee. But, of course, I, I, I've got this highlighted. Leave your life of sin. He's not condoning the sin. That's quite clear. But he's saying we're not having capital punishment for that. But, you know, the sin still needs to be dealt with. In the Old Testament, people took a lamb. And they killed it. <laughs> you know, 
that's quite horrifying, isn't it, really? You know, if I came in here tonight and said, oh, there's a nice little lamb, and then suddenly took a knife out and slit its throat and walked around you and started sprinkling the blood all over. I, I mean, it's horrendous, because that no longer applies, because the Bible in Hebrew says we have had a final sacrifice. And so just because something is there in the Bible doesn't necessarily mean that it applies all the way through. Some of the things do uh, change. Uh, and finally, uh, God's character requires full consideration. You talked about God's justice, and of course that is right, right? God is a God of justice, and we need to say that. But that's not the total picture of God. He's certainly a God of holiness and justice, demanding that sin be punished. And you're quite right, Faith, as well. What's, what is the punishment of, of sin, the wages of sin? Death. But you see, one of the things that I always try to get in and say, okay, there is all this suffering in the Old Testament. It is to do with suffering because of sin. There are consequences because of sin. But actually, God is also a God of love. And the God whom we have got is astounding. Because the God whom we serve, we meet in the person of Jesus Christ, crucified, condemned as a criminal, hanging on a tree. And that is the essential part of our message, that, um, that sin has terrible consequences. But actually those consequences have been paid for through Jesus. So when people ask me about it, I say, look, I can't give you a full answer. These are some of the things. It's not goodies versus baddies. There are the terrible uh, threats of contamination. There were some really evil things that were um, going on there. But don't forget that the, the, the main message of the Bible is that sin is serious. Sin demands suffering. But Jesus has actually taken that. So I would always end with that. Okay. So I hope that that is helpful as i say um please get the notes uh the the ones that i sent to jim there's full page color slides so you can see all of those and put them up on your computer you can print off the notes in black and white as well so i hope that that will help so I'll Can we show appreciation to Pastor Peter for this? Isn't it been good? We, we were sitting in the staff meeting planning, like thought of what we're going to do in these, some of these sessions. And it was raised about, um, the question was raised, how do we answer people when they talk about these questions of, how, um, of genocide, Old Testament genocide, they talk about those sort of things. And then when Pastor Peter mentioned a couple of weeks ago, Michelle thought I'd spoken to him about it because we're going to get someone to come do a session on it. So you've done it perfectly. Because that was one of our sessions. Because it's a really relevant thing. Because apparently, I said to Pastor Peter, apparently among the younger generation on TikTok, they've got a lot of videos. If you don't know what TikTok is, Chris Moss will explain it to you. He's an expert in these young youth hip things. But actually, apparently, it's a, listening today, it's apparently a really big thing to actually have these conversations. So for us, we need to be prepared to have an answer as Peter um, calls us to do, and especially for your grandkids, um, for your kids, when they see this stuff and they start asking these questions. So thank you so much for that. Can we also show appreciation for Joan again as well, for all the tea and coffees and cakes that she's provided for us last week. These are hopefully going to be online in the next couple of weeks. Um, and so if you want to rewatch them, and they're available for other people to watch as well. But should we close in prayer? Lord, I thank you today that you are an awesome God. You are a God who, Lord, you've, you give us revelation. There's these texts, these stories that we can learn from. And Lord, I just really pray for us, Lord. I pray for us as individuals, Lord, that we will live a life that is glorifying to you, Jesus. But we also pray, Lord, for us as a church, that we as a church community, when it could never be accused of even the small sins that Israel did and the other people and the Canaanites did, and Lord, in a world that is crazy, that feels like it's getting worse and worse at times, Lord, I pray you'd help us to be the soul and light to make a difference, Lord. Help us to shine out so differently that people will choose to go your way, Lord, 
not the way um, that the Canaanites went and a lot of folk are going today. We pray that in your precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys.